morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for turning out. And if you want to move up, you're more than welcome to. I promise you I won't bite. I won't grab your wallet. Now, all I'm going to grab is your attention. What I'm hoping to do in this presentation is I'm going to give you the benefit of a 70-year-old man talking to you about 40 years of UFO investigation and along the way a 35-year career as a professional investigator. I've been an Army military police investigator. That actually figures into the story in a strange way. I was a police officer for 20 years. I was promoted to sergeant. I've supervised a fatal accident team. I've been a patrol sergeant, a detective sergeant. After that, I was a child abuse detective, and I finished off my career with 10 years as a state fraud investigator. So I think it's fairly safe to say that I've talked to a lot of people, interviewed a lot of witnesses, and I know something about putting a report together. I'm not making light of this, but I do have experience with crashed vehicles. This was a tragic accident that I had to work on once. And as I'll show you in a moment, I have had up close and personal contact with non-human intelligence. That was recovered stolen property taken in a burglary. The first segment of what I'm going to present to you is something that you can take with you. And I actually have this on a business card if you would like a copy. What do you do if you see a UFO? And there are a number of ways that you could report it. We're going to go through these piece by piece. But one of the most important things you can do is right after the encounter, one way or another, take notes. You got to write it down. You won't remember it properly. And it may be so exciting that you're going to be kind of overwhelmed. If you have a lot of training and experience, you'll immediately note the date and the time, when it started and when it ended, and the location, the direction that the unidentified object was flying, and one thing people would like to know, if this occurred in the dark, what does the area look like in the daylight? Report the event as soon as possible. And if you're going to write a report or send it in as a recording, a video, or whatever, think about your audience. Uh, we don't want to hear a big long narrative about, hey man, that was really exciting. We should have seen it, it was too cool. You know, that's fine if that's your spontaneous response during the event, but we want to know the facts, like you're a news reporter. Field of view. How big is it? You may not know for sure how big the UFO was. If I tell you that I saw a full-size sedan parked a block away, you and I will both instantly know just about how big it is. But if I tell you there's a UFO hovering down the block, how do you know how big it is, especially if it's after dark? I don't pretend to know what an Aldebaran Star Cruiser 2022 model looks like or how big it is. So these things come in all different shapes and sizes and colors. So the field of view, just how much of what you could see did it take up? A lot, a little, a tiny bit? If you held your arm out at arm's length, what is the smallest object held in your hand that would just cover up the UFO? Could you cover it with a pencil eraser, a baseball, or a newspaper, for instance? We want to know the size, color, shape, sound, and any effects that it had on the environment. Did it make your radio go off? Did your TV go out? Did your power go out? Did everything flicker? Did it change while you were looking at it? And make note of that. What changes came over the UFO? 
And now here is a big one that goes right to the heart of what we're beginning to appreciate more and more in UFOs. Keep a diary. Unusual dreams or odd occurrences before the event, during the event, or after. There seems to be a definite pattern amongst the witnesses who've had very serious UFO encounters. They will have odd events. Many of them have described it almost like having something that followed them home. Here's my other point. How do you estimate size and distance? You could make a pretty good estimate of how big that UFO is because you know what a pickup truck is and how big it is. If that wasn't there, it might be very difficult. When you go to the doctor and you have something wrong with you that's not readily explained, the doctor will analyze all of your symptoms and try to figure out what you don't have. How often have I said to you that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth? From Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the character of Sherlock Holmes. That has a lot to do with how we investigate UFOs. Change chapter. We're at a very strange point in UFO history. Today is the 75th anniversary of the UFO crash in Roswell. That's why we're here. That's where modern UFO history begins. And I will say it for the record very bluntly, the Roswell crash did involve an extraterrestrial vehicle with non-human occupants. It was investigated by the military. It was recovered. There has been a massive cover-up ever since. There are many, many reasons why I believe this is true. I've actually had to change the tenor of my presentation today. That's how quickly things are happening. I got to meet Lou Elizondo while I was here. I don't know. How many of you, did you go to the museum? Did you? get to meet Lou Elizondo. He was way different than I thought he would be. And I'll tell you why here in a minute, why I came into that with a little bit of trepidation. But here we have the three key people. We have Tom DeLong from Blink-182, a formidable rock musician, Mr. Lou Elizondo, and Chris Millen, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Intelligence. You think about that for a minute. What kind of a position is that for two presidents? This is a very intelligent man with a lot on the ball. He just happened to leave something on his website, which UFO researchers are often like moles, and they keep digging, and you can't get rid of them. They found this small PowerPoint presentation on Chris Mellon's website, and it talked about the reality of UFOs and the fact that it left the United States vulnerable to psychotronic weapons, cognitive human interface, penetration of solid surfaces, etc., anomalies in the space-time construct, and unique Cognitive human interface experiences. Boy, that's a mouthful. What exactly does that mean? Well, first off, I thought that the word psychotronic was interesting. It turns out it has two totally different meanings. One of them is of or relating to a B movies of horror and science fiction. But it also refers to the theory of interactions over distance. Interactions bound by an energetic form that is not yet understood. That's almost a perfect short definition of 
quantum physics. Because the saying goes that if you think you understand quantum physics, you don't. It's sort of a Zen thing. <laughs> then we find out that the Department of Defense has been involved in similar experiments in the past. The Department of Defense has relationships with renowned subject matter experts. Somewhere in there, there must be a ufologist. The Department of Defense controls several facilities where activities have been detected, like the Skinwalker Ranch that's owned by Robert Bigelow, just as an example. Here's a question I want you to ask yourself. And this is probably the big question on trying to understand what's going on. If you work 20 or 30 years in the intelligence world, do you think that you would be able to tell the public anything related to national security without authorization? What kind of a non-disclosure agreement do you sign after you've worked for the CIA for 30 years? My guess is that down in the fine print, it says that if you say the wrong thing and they have to take you out, they agree to do it in such a way that they don't have to have a closed coffin funeral. But that's just my theory. In other words, these people have a duty, and I don't want you to misunderstand me. They do work that's vital to the survival of the United States, and I'm as much of a patriot as anybody else. I happen to be crossways with a lot of them because UFOs are my true passion, as you may have figured out already. And there he is, the man. He formed the To the Stars Academy. And to my understanding, he basically barged his way in and got interviews with people in high, high places. And we, we have a tendency to think we say the government or the military as if it's a monolith. Surprise, you know who staffs those places? People. And here's what I saw in 30 years of law enforcement and state fraud investigations. You can divide any organization into three groups. There's 5%, 90%, and 5%. There's 5% that are stellar. They're on their way up. They are high achievers, and they work very, very hard. 90% of the people in the organization are trying to do a good job, and they're also worried about their homes and families and getting on with life. And in every organization, no matter how prestigious, there are 5% of the people who work there that nobody can figure out how they got their job, let alone how they managed to stay employed. I've seen that over and over again. I doubt these intelligence agencies are any different. And then there's the media. And the media is a huge factor in trying to understand UFOs. That's a picture of the famous Tic Tac UFO, the 2004 UFO sighting off the coast of California by San Diego. We've all heard about it over and over again. Repeat after me, there were no important UFO events before 2004. <laughs> I don't think so. For God's sakes, I'm in Roswell. I got to meet David Fravor because he was at the McMinnville, Oregon UFO Festival, which Joanne and I are a regular annual fixture there, and we adore it. If you're gonna to go to one other UFO conference, come to McMinnville, you'll have an awesome time. And David Fraber is everything you would expect out of an extremely experienced, dedicated combat fire, fighter pilot. You know what the bottom line thought he had when he saw the Tic Tac? He said, I want to fly one of those because it flies in ways that he has never seen before and no aircraft that they've ever turned him loose with performs like it did. But that was what he told me. 
He said, I want to fly that. I'm a little cynical at times. And this is what I worry is going on. This is my worst fear. Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. That's from 1984 by George Orwell. In other words, if here and now I can change the whole UFO narrative, and I don't like Madison Avenue rebranding, I'm sorry, I will say UFO throughout this presentation. You will not hear me use UAP except maybe a couple of times. I'm old school, I admit it. If I opened a school for investigators and detectives, this would be carved over the front door in gold. Nothing is ever what it appears to be. That's why you investigate, because there's something more than what you see on the surface. You have to dig in and listen and evaluate. Has anybody here ever fenced the, the sport fencing? I did briefly in high school. Well, do you know what a feint is? That's where you come at your opponent with your sword, and then as you go in, you go out, and then at the last possible moment, you go back in for the kill. That is a feint. It's any distracting or deceptive maneuver. It's designed to draw people out and make them think one thing, when actually there's something else going on. An example might be pretending to be fair and objective or transparent when you actually have a predetermined outcome, or informing the public that UFOs and UAPs are real now when you already knew this 75 years ago. And we have strong evidence that that is true. I want to just briefly have you all heard of the To The Stars Academy? That's what Tom DeLong created. And it, in the beginning, they, they wanted to be all-encompassing, kind of the Walmart of advanced technology and entertainment and everything else. Eventually, it became just an entertainment enterprise. But I looked at the people who were on the board of directors, and it lists their curriculum vitae, and I was fascinated. Jim Semivan, co-founder, 25 years as an operations officer, CIA. Hal Putoff, I met him years ago in 2000 under various mysterious circumstances, and he actually helped me. That man is privileged to everything. When you hear the name Hal Putoff, you need to pay close attention to what he's doing and what he's involved with. He's been working behind the scenes for years on advanced technology. You look, here we have a former director, White House Information and Technology. Now we have Joe Sherman, White Sands Missile Testing, NASA and the Johnson Space Center, Dr. Paul Rapp, CIA again, we have Dr. Gilpin, who's involved in biomedicine at Johns Hopkins, and Dr. Norm Kahn. Now this, this caused me to lose a little sleep when I saw this. CIA counter bioweapons program, 30 plus years, CIA national security consultant. But I'm gonna tell you in a little bit why I, I'm not losing sleep anymore. But here is where To The Stars Academy and this group of people come together. What we have is a merging of three areas. The intelligence community, science and technology, private industry, and media. I covered that question already. There's kind of a chilly quotation from a former director of the CIA. 
And this is one of the disturbing things. It's a fact. Ever since World, World War II, the intelligence agencies have embedded themselves in major media productions. You could say that's good, you could say it's bad, you could say they had to do it. Sometimes they almost take us off a cliff. Like one of the examples that I read about recently was that right after the two bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the government announced that there was no such thing as radiation sickness after pictures of some of the people who were horrifically burned in those two cities were published. There is no such thing as radiation sickness. It's an interesting stance, and that's kind of a creepy quote. So what are we talking about? We're talking about coincidences. Now you're gonna think I'm one of these paranoid conspiracy theorists. I'm not, but I do believe in looking for all the connections. The To The Stars Research Academy announced this medal that they were going to have researched, this mystery medal. I will tell you that in 2000 in Newport Beach, California, I handled that medal. It was originally sent to Art Bell by an unknown person who said, this was in Grandpa's box. Grandpa was in the Army and he was assigned to missions in the Southwest and this is what he recovered. And no, I'm not going to tell you who I am because I have a pension. Art Bell. Everybody remember good old Art Bell? I hope we have some ex-Art Bell fans in here. No? Yes? Okay. Well, Art Bell one night was doing a broadcast, and this was a couple of years after a friend of mine, June Crane, had passed away. This was at the beginning of 2000. I was sitting in a patrol car, listening to the AM radio, there was a UFO program on Art Bell, and it was put on by Robert Wood and Ryan Wood, and they were talking about the majestic documents. And it was a great program, and I was really riveted. And they had an 800 number, and I wrote it down, and the next morning when I was off duty, I called it. And I said, oh, by the way, I'm a sergeant in the police department, and I have some testimony from a woman who worked at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, between 42 and 52, and she had a lot to say about UFOs. That was June Green. We'll hear a little more about her later. Suddenly, I get a phone call, and I was called to a conference in Southern California, and all of the people who were there were experts in the UFO field. Stanton Friedman couldn't be there, Jim Mars was there, Linda Moulton Howe, and Dr. Howe put off. And one of the things he did was he offered to help my research, which he did. He sent me some very interesting publications. That metal is alternating layers of bismuth and magnesium. I held it in my hand because Linda Moulton Howe showed it to everybody in the room. And this was a big piece to fit the palm of my hand about. And I knew that it was something that had been manufactured. The problem with this metal is, everybody agrees that it was manufactured. Nobody has been able to find any record of anybody making anything like this. Bismuth turns out to be a dimagnetic metal. So it can be used as shielding against magnetism. The magnesium is for weight, obviously. We use magnesium to build aircraft. But nobody knows who built it, who built, who created this metal, who manufactured it. How did we get here? Why is there such a level of mistrust of the government by the UFO community? Back in 1952, a top secret panel was held, the Robertson panel, commissioned by the Central Intelligence Agency because there were so many UFO reports. 1952, that by the way, involved 
mass UFO sightings over Washington, D.C. You can definitely find many references to this. Fighter planes were scrambled. At one point, there were UFOs in the restricted area over the White House. Nobody could do anything about it. This panel advocated a public relations campaign to make UFOs go away so that anybody who reported a UFO or talked about UFOs would be ridiculed. That's why we still have this residual automatic reaction to the UFO subject. I must be a raving lunatic. Anybody who sees a UFO is drunk on drugs, has psychiatric problems. Nothing could be further from the truth. The goal was also to monitor civilian UFO groups. Boy, that'll make you paranoid. In 1966, the Air Force hired Dr. Condon and the University of Colorado to do a UFO study. But it wasn't an independent study. The goal of the study was to get the Air Force out of the public UFO investigation business. They wanted to get rid of dealing with all of us taxpayers. So Dr. Condon was the right guy to do the job. It's my inclination right now to recommend that the government get out of this UFO business. My attitude is that there's nothing to it, but I'm not supposed to reach that conclusion for another year. That's not what I would call an objective investigation. You always got to figure out whether somebody is investigating the unexplained or explaining the uninvestigated. Now, what was the conclusion of the common report? No UFO has ever demonstrated a threat to national security. There's a problem with that. In 1967 and 1975, we have actual UFOs over ICBM sites, and we have blocks of missiles going down. And the actual documents that are in the back of Robert Salas's book, Faded Giant, are all teletypes where the Air Force and the electrical engineers at Boeing in Seattle are having a rather uh, spirited and heated exchange. They're trying to figure out how something that was supposedly built so well that nothing could interfere with it was taken offline. Those are the famous Trent photos, May 11, 1950, McMinnville, Oregon. Two of the best UFO photos ever taken. Nobody has ever been able to prove that they were hoaxed including the Air Force's own expert. And to show you what contempt they had for the public, when they published their final big, thick report, they crammed their own report on the Trek photos in the back. And in there it says plainly that the UFO, these UFOs are real. A large circular object flying around the sky in broad daylight. Project Blue Book. Everybody's ears heard about Blue Book one way or another. It ran from 1952 to 1969. Meanwhile, on a parallel track, not known to the public, we have Gen App 146 and AFR200. They continued the entire time. That they provided the channels for UFOs to be reported through the military. In the case of the Air Force, the reports must go through the Foreign Technology Division at guess where? Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. They had a system created to keep track of sightings that they thought were significant from a national security viewpoint of objects that they told us did not exist. That's the book by Robert Salas, who was another one of the speakers here. And I frequently talk about this book because 
is very straightforward and well documented. How many of you have heard of this sighting? Tehran sighting of September 19, 1976. This is a hot one. Oh, this has got good details in it. It's got a fighter pilot being scrambled. In fact, a couple of fighter pilots. In particular, that gentleman who later became head of the Iranian Air Force. He's flying. At one point, he tried to do missile lock-on with the UFO, and immediately, all of his systems shut down. Everything blacked out. He started falling out of the sky like a rock. And as soon as he got pointed away from the UFO, everything came back on. This was reported. There was a landing associated with this. Numerous public witnesses, etc. You know who went crazy over it? The Defense Intelligence Agency. These are the actual teletypes. They were wildly interested in this, as were all of the other major powers. The fact that somebody could fly an aircraft like that, that had incredible performance, that could shut down one of our fighter planes. Throughout the history of UFOs, and this is probably something you want to take with you, there's always this duality there's two things going on at the same time. I think of it as being on a beach with a riptide. This was a statement made by General Nathan Twining, who was, at the time in 1947, wrote a top secret memo to his boss that was rela later released to the public. The phenomenon reported is something real and not visionary or fictitious. He, by the way, would have been June Crane, this witness I'll refer to many times, would have been her boss many levels up, the Air Material Command in the U.S. Air Force. Helen Carter was one of the first directors of the CIA, high-ranking naval officer, he was also on the board of the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, the original professional UFO investigative organization. So think how that all comes together. There's President Truman. July 26, 1947, that would be, July 26 would be, what, a couple, three weeks from now? Think about it back in 1947. The Roswell event occurs on the July 4th weekend, and on the three weeks later, the National Security Act is signed. It's one of the most powerful pieces of legislation ever enacted. In one fell swoop, we reorganized our entire defense system. A National Security Council was formed, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Department of Defense, that was a name change from the Department of War. The United States Air Force was created as a separate branch of the service, as was the Central Intelligence Agency that had its roots in the OSS in World War II. If you happen to collect UFO books, this one may be a little more difficult to get, although they, they have it on Kindle. The gentleman who wrote this is passed away. He, lives, he lived on Bainbridge Island up in my part of the country, the Pacific Northwest. What he wrote was a book called The Missing Times, The News Media Complicity in the UFO Cover-Up. This is one of those books, I've got like three or four that are like my main go-to books. It's completely footnoted and it will scare you a bit. And it talks about how we are manipulated with propaganda, disinformation, and ridicule, and anything that's necessary to make the UFO subject go away. 
That's a quote from his book. The fear, of course, the justification is, if we were told the truth, society would fall apart. I don't know, after COVID and everything else that has gone on in the last couple of years, if they told you that aliens were real and that they had landed on the earth before, would that necessarily change a whole lot? I don't know, maybe not right away. I happen to believe it would in the long run. I've been sitting across from Gork for the last three days from the museum. <laughs> But I love this movie. It came out the year I was born, 1951. Great sci-fi movie of all time. And we have Klaatu's warning that if we don't clean up our act and we take our violence into outer space, they're going to turn the Earth into a burned out cinder. I don't know if that's true or not, but clearly we need to figure out how to treat each other better. Interestingly enough, a name that pops up in the background is Daryl Zanuck. If you look him up on IMDb, that man is a heavy hitter, producer, and director in the history of Hollywood. And it turns out that as far as his patriotic service, we see Army Signal Corps and the National Committee for Free Europe, which was created by the CIA in 1949. A future CIA director, Alan Dulles, was involved, as well as a future president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who, of course, was commander of all of the forces that went into Europe. So here we have a direct connection between the military, the intelligence agency, and the movies. That book called Silver Screen Saucers is another one that's really good. Now, this is how I believe the UFO community shoots itself in the foot. I actually saw that this man was starting to appear at some UFO conferences. And I thought, I'm glad it's not at anyone that I'm attending because I would probably embarrass myself. This is not someone I like. Project Beta, written by Greg Bishop. This has been documented over and over again six ways from Sunday. Paul Benowitz was a defense contractor, a patriotic man who lived outside of Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque. He thought, because he was able to monitor mysterious radio transmissions, for some reason he came to the conclusion that these were from aliens and that he had observed some very strange aircraft there. It's highly probable that these were experimental aircraft. But the response of the Air Force was to send Richard Doty in from the Office of Special Investigations of the Air Force. He was an undercover agent, and he was paid to make Mr. Benowitz's claims go away. His idea of a good time was to break into this man's house repeatedly, along with the NSA, and create things that would convince Mr. Benowitz that we were under threat of hostile, imminent alien invasion to the point that he had a nervous breakdown and had to be institutionalized. I would say fairly safely that was a misuse of taxpayer money. And quite frankly, the idea that anybody in the UFO community would pay, I don't know how he has the gall to show up at a UFO conference. And who would hire him? Sometimes we will do anything for a buck in the UFO field, and that's sad. But here we are in 2017. The same agencies that denied, censored, ridiculed, and in some cases did more extreme things are now saying UFOs are real. How do we do, deal with that? Well, we'll start back where we are. The headline heard round the world. When that headline came out that a flying disc was captured by the Roswell Army Airfield, it went all over the world. Reporters from everywhere started calling Roswell. This was the biggest story ever. And then, as we know, General Ramey deflated it. This is how I really got into this 
whole thing. We came down here to the Southwest to have a trip together. We wanted to go someplace we'd never been before. We ended up down in the Southwest and because of bad weather high up in the mountains, we couldn't go where we were going to go. And so my wife let me come to Roswell, even though it was not originally planned. I ended up bringing a transcript from this woman I interviewed who worked at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and I donated it to the gentleman on the left there in the white shirt. You may recognize him if you know the story. That was Glenn Dennis, who was a young man who worked at the Ballard Funeral Home here in Roswell, and he got the famous phone call wanting to know how many child-sized coffins do you have in stock? He said, well, they only had one. And they said, can you get more? It'll take a couple of days. That's too long. They called back later and they said, if you have found a body out in the desert and you wanted to preserve it for transport, how would you do it? He said, dry ice. And they said, thank you. Later on that day, he ended up showing up at Walker Army Airfield he was transporting an injured airman, and there was an unusual amount of activity. People in vehicles he hadn't seen before. He made a comment inside about, did something crash? And boy, that brought down the thunder. He got confronted by a belligerent officer who told him he better shut his mouth and not ask any more questions. He said, you can't talk to me that way. I'm a civilian. And they said, your bones will bleach in the desert as well as anyone else's. Then he met the nurse, who was a friend of his, who had been called into work. She had been involved in an autopsy of a non-human being. I'm shortening up a lot of details. She was so upset by being involved in that autopsy that she resigned her commission, and Glenn Dennis promised her something that he took to his grave. He never revealed her true name. Now you'll see controversy around him. When I came here that time and donated that transcript to the UFO Museum, their way of saying thank you was I got to go into a closed room and drink coffee with Glenn Dennis for about a half hour. When I walked out of that room, any doubt that I ever had about the reality of Roswell was forever gone. That man was a gentleman and a straight arrow, and he did the best he could, and he was honest to a fault. He kept his promise. The other man is Walter Howe. Both of them were directors of this UFO museum when I came here. Walter Howe worked for William Blanchard, who was the base commander. Walter Howe was the public information officer who was instructed to release that shocking headline from his boss, a man that he also viewed as a father figure, William Blanchard, who was then a full bowl colonel and the base commander. Now I wanna ask you something and you think about this. If you work for a major organization and you did a press release that said something really controversial happened like recovering a flying saucer. And it made news all around the world so that everybody was focused on your organization in that moment. If you lied about that, do you think you would still have a job afterwards? Oddly enough, William Blanchard went on to be promoted until the mid-60s when he died at his desk in the Pentagon of a massive heart attack. He was a four-star general. He had commanded every major command in the Air Force, and they were looking at him as a candidate to be the Secretary of Defense. I would put to you that his release of that document was completely according to a predetermined strategy, as was the General Ramey takedown a couple days later when they made Jesse Marcel into a fall guy and forced him to have his photo taken with a bunch of pieces of deflated weather balloon. The last 
time that Joanne and I were in Roswell was 2017. And they had a nighttime parade that year. I guess they've quit doing night parades now. But I sat next to that lady on the left, Frankie Rowe, on a float. And she told me her life story that night. And the next morning, Joanne got to spend some time with her talking about anything and everything. And Joanne is a palm reader, so that's actually a picture of, of her reading Frankie's poem, Palm. She was a lovely lady. She was an honored and revered guest of the UFO Museum. And this may have been one of the last photos taken of her because she passed away three weeks later. Why is that important? Because when she was 12 years old living in Roswell, her father was Frank Dwyer, who was on the Roswell Fire Department. And she found out later, after the beginning of the story, that he had responded to the crash of an old egg-shaped aerial vehicle that had three beings left in it, two dead and one alive. And they were run off by the military. That's what Frankie learned later. But initially what happened, she stopped at the fire station to get a ride home with her father because she had a dentist appointment. She got in there, there was a New Mexico State Trooper who was showing off a piece of metal. This is the mystery metal. You wad it up into a ball, you can't cut it, you can't poke a hole in it, it returns to its original shape, flows like water, and it weighs nothing and everybody would like to get their hands on this metal. It's come up in a couple of places, including with my friend June. But Frankie got to hold a piece of this metal, as did everybody there. She went home, and a day or so later, a very belligerent, threatening military police lieutenant and two other MPs forced their way into her home. She was alone at home with her mother. Her other sister wasn't there. And she was threatened by this MP and told while he was slapping a baton in his hand that if she ever talked about what she saw or held in that fire station, she would be murdered, her family would be murdered, and their bodies would be taken out of the desert. Now think about telling a 12-year-old girl that. Now you say, okay, maybe she made up this story. I used to be a child sex abuse detective. I'm also a police officer. I've interviewed hundreds of people in crisis. What Frankie Rowe had was post-traumatic stress disorder from what happened to her as a young girl. And even at 80 some years old, she was still terrified of that man. In 1997, there was a bad storm where she was living. Her phone went out. She called the phone company and when the repairman was done, came down to tell her she had phone service, he said, did you know your phone is tapped? And she said, no. He gave her this little device. He said, this is an old style phone tap. But somebody was listening to your phone calls. Then we have the final chapter in 2012. She started uh, being interviewed, talking to Don Schmidt and Tom Carey. A man knocked at her front door with a big bouquet of flowers. Said, it was my father who threatened you when you were a little girl, and I'm here to apologize on behalf of my family. He was a terrible, cruel man, and he was doing what he was told to do in Roswell, to silence the people who knew anything about the crash. I'm sorry, but that's a dark chapter in our government. This is a sad thing. We'll change gears again. I keep bringing back the theme of media manipulation. I love this movie. The Men in Black was just awesome. Here I'm bringing you the scene from Tommy Lee Jones and Agent J. Or Agent J is saying, these are the hot sheets, Will Smith. Agent K says, best damn investigating reporting on the planet. But hey, go ahead and read the New York Times if you want. They get lucky sometimes. <laughs> it turns out that's not far from the truth. 
That man, you probably don't know him. That's Generoso Pope Jr. And he founded the National Enquirer, which is probably the most notorious of all the tabloids. Anybody want to guess where he worked before he founded the newspaper? CIA. Uh, where? CIA. You're good. <laughs> Either that or you've seen this before. Um, his last job from 1950 to 1954, the CIA Psychological Warfare Unit. Now there's an odd career choice. And when he wanted to start the paper, he didn't have any trouble getting loans. Wow. Oh, a coincidence. Now here's the question, and I guess this is what troubles me. I'm going to have to take some of what's happening on faith. Is there any such thing as an ex-CIA agent? That's a question. No. How do you hide the truth with tabloids? That's how. I could I could pick any one of dozens. Once you associate the source of a story with something that's nonsense or that people automatically say can't be true, then if you want to make a good story go bad, put the real story in there. There's some pretty good evidence that that's true. That's the Travis Walton story, and there's one hell of a lot of evidence that that's true. I happen to, we've known Travis for quite a few years now, and that's a real story. Not what's in the movie. Don't confuse the movie with the Travis Walton story. That whole section in the middle of the movie where he's taken on a spaceship that's pure Hollywood, pure fiction. That is not what happened. UFOs spotted in nuclear bases or missile sites. Now you take the entire subject of UFOs associated with nukes and you just destroyed it because you put it in a tabloid. So it, what's, what are we supposed to conclude? It can't be true, but it is. Put this in the bank. UFOs and anything nuclear, they go together like coffee and cream. UFOs and nukes, the important book by Robert Hastings, who's another unsung hero in the field of ufology, a brilliant book. He spent years interviewing former contractors and military people who would talk about UFOs that were in the proximity of classified nuclear sites. How did they know this would work? It all started on October 30th, 1938. Orson Welles did the famous broadcast and some people actually took it seriously, to the point that it started a minor panic. That must mean that mass media is very powerful. Now we're going to switch back. What is the Air Force doing meanwhile? In 1962, they adopt Air Force Regulation 200-2. What does this produce? a complete internal system for reporting UFO sightings to the Foreign Technology Division at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. That's a self bomber by the way. I actually saw that on, that's at the Air Force Museum. If you ever get a chance to go to the Air Force Flight Museum in Dayton, Ohio, go. That's the best flight museum I've ever seen in my life. And the beauty of it is the admission is free. Your tax dollars paid for it. But boy, is it worth it. It's beautiful. What is the Air Force mission? They protect the skies over the United States. 
and their goal is to detect, identify, intercept, and destroy if necessary. That's their mission. Here they actually define new foreign air vehicles of unconventional design. That obviously is UFOs. The famous Bollinger Memo, which says that UFOs will be reported internally and not externally. So what's the bottom line here? You may recognize that from the X-Files. That was the second deep throw, but he says it best. There are no answers for you, Mr. Mulder. They only have one policy, deny everything. And that's pretty much been the truth to this day. Meanwhile, I've joined the ranks of UFO researchers. 35 years ago, Kenji Tiroshi sighted an enormous UFO over Anchorage, Alaska. He reported it, the FAA confirmed it, then they denied it, then they confirmed it. First there was a mountain, then there was no mountain, then there is. He basically lost his job. He was taken off flight status for many years. That's his diagram that he drew. You can see the little airplane down on the right, that's his airplane. Now that leads into the National UFO Reporting Center, 206-722-3000. I originally heard about that because that business card was underneath the plexiglass by the military police desk sergeant at Fort Lewis, Washington, where I was a plainclothes investigator. And I asked the desk sergeant, I said, what's that? And he said, that's where we report UFOs. I thought, wow, okay, I remembered that. And after I got out of the Army, Right after that sighting went all over the news from Kenji Tiroshi in 87, I called that number and I spoke to that man, Bob Gribble, and I said, I don't want to report a UFO, I want to help. And that was when he said, have you ever heard of MUFON? I started getting involved with Seattle MUFON. And then I met an extraordinary man who was still a close personal friend. Peter Davenport, director of the National UFO Reporting Center. I'm trying to scoot this along a little bit because I'm obviously going to run out of time if I'm not careful. There's so much in this field. And yet, this is how I feel after 35 years of panning for UF gold. It's a lot like being what I think being a gold miner would be like. You spend a lot of time up to your butt in icy cold water standing in mud. And you pan for gold, and every once in a while you get some gold dust, and you keep thinking that maybe you're on the trail of that mother load that is just around the bend upstairs. This is what I think UFOs are. At least this is looking at it from the outside objectively. There are reported UFOs. There are unreported UFOs. The unreported includes restricted secret reports, debunked reports in the media that cause UFOs to get lost. That's UFO reality. This is just news stories. I could have put 50 of these things up there. That's the kind of thing that exists. All of these are significant UFO events. You can find a book or books on any one of these. They have had numerous interviews and studies done about all of them. Battle for Los Angeles, Kenneth Arnold sighting over Mount Rainier up where I live, Roswell, Hanford at the nuclear site in 1949, McMinnville, New Hampshire. You've heard of these cases if you've studied UFOs. 
They're all important. What is a UFO researcher? Here's the problem. If you're an astronomer, these are your receivers. If you investigate UFOs, these are your receivers. It's all of us. And the problem is that human beings to any big event, and I know this from investigating crimes, people bring their own perspective on life, their prejudices, their li medical limitations, any number of things can affect the way that they perceive an event and how they will describe it to you or what motive they have for telling you the truth or an embellished truth or even trying to fool you. But I do love people, they're my species. <laughs> now here's another one you can put in the bank. Take any 10 UFO reports. Three will have insufficient evidence to evaluate. Three will be identified flying objects. The number one culprit is the International Space Station. Two are information only cases or hoaxes. You can't do much with them. But two out of every 10 have high witness credibility plus high witness, high strangeness. A true foe, high strangeness event and high witness credibility. You put those two things together and you have gold. Roswell is the mother load. I took two years worth of reports to the National UFO Reporting Center. Two out of every 10 are UFOs. That means you have about 2,127 true foes a year or 1,063 cases a year. That means you've got about, on the average, rough average, three true foes reported daily. That's a lot when you start talking about years. I took 700 cases that I investigated personally for the Mutual UFO Network and broke them into categories on how I closed them. And guess what? 22% of them are unknown aerial vehicles slash UFO slash UAP. Even the Air Force in their special report number 14 a long time ago, 1955 completed by the Battelle Institute, 3,201 reported UFO cases and they got 21.5% unknowns. That's why I really do stand on that two out of every 10. It works really well. Now, another thing we look for, if you knew you were coming to the end of your life and you knew something of importance, especially if it was important to everyone in the world, would you be more or less likely to tell the truth? Here we have a quotation from DuBose, who is in that picture sitting in the background while Roger Ramey is holding up the weather balloon fragments. About five to six months before he died, the weather balloon explanation for the material was a cover story to divert the attention of the press. There you have it. There's poor Jesse Marcel. And I believe 1983, he fully disclosed, having been diagnosed with terminal lung cancer, that the material that he found on Matt Brazel's ranch was not of this earth. That's the legal definitions of a dying declaration. I'm going to accelerate through that. I read a book recently called In Plain Sight by Ross Coulthard, who's an Australian journalist. He contacted me because he wanted 
to swap books with me and get a copy of my June Grain story. In his book, he found this man and he spoke to him at length for the last few weeks of Nat Kovitz's life. This man had an extraordinary life. Director of Advanced Technology Development and Assessment, Director of Research and Development, Program Manager for Advanced Ship and Foreign Ship Building. This man basically was the technology wizard for the United States Navy. And his educational credentials go on and on and on. He's a master of what is known as electron beam welding. He was called to consult at a high security area at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and examine a piece of wreckage that had an attached, damaged structural beam. And he was told to especially pay attention to the way that the beam was attached to the plating. His evaluation was, we can't do that. Electron beam welding is the most sophisticated form of welding that anybody knows about. And here's the man who invented it, saying that the piece of metal he was shown, we can't duplicate that level of technology. Nobody can. And this guy had every security clearance in the book. The reason I think he's important, aside from what he just said, is that he was a, clearly an insider. June Crane was somewhat of an insider. She worked in a top secret laboratory at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Dayton, Ohio, had a Q-level security clearance. I considered to be, her to be a witness, a friend, and a mentor. And thankfully, I got to know her in 1997 because she died on August 23rd of 1998. I met her after a library program in 93. It took her four years to decide to talk to me. Why? Because she signed a notice of security obligation when she left their employment. She could be put in prison or fined. She was afraid that it still applied. And it probably did. She almost kept her secret forever. This would have been some UFO information that was lost. But I'll never forget that day. I'm 72 years old. I've outlived two husbands. My cancer is in remission. What are they going to do? Shoot me or put me in prison? I can do either one. And that's when I said, how soon can I be at your house? I started staying up nights with her, having coffee. She and I were, became friends. She gave me all of her personal papers. She let me record her. I eventually got a complete copy of her file from the National Personnel Records Center. This is an aerial view of where she lived, out in Ocean Shores, Washington. June 27th was when I did the key interview with her that is the core part of the book that I wrote. At one point, an officer came into her office trying to flirt with her. A lot of this is the story of a uh, precocious, intelligent woman working in an all-male environment back in the 40s and 50s. And that's kind of interesting, too, even without the UFO angle. But here comes this officer who wants to flirt with her, walks into her office, reaches in, pulls out a piece of metal and says, here, June, you're a good worker, tear it out. Cut it with your scissors. And I think you know where this is going. Couldn't pierce it, couldn't cut it, couldn't do anything with it. Uh, Watered into a ball, flows back to an original shape, flows like water. And June says, what is it? And he bends down and he says, it's a piece of a spaceship. And she goes, oh, come on, what is it really? It's a piece of a spaceship. And about that time, another officer walks by and he does one of these, oh, I wasn't really talking to you, and walks away. Now, June had many interesting stories. 
And even if she hadn't mentioned UFOs, I would have loved her story just to hear about somebody who worked in a place like that. Because she talked to me about spies and security measures involving safes that she was in charge of. And it was a wild, interesting ride, but it also had the UFO in. I took every part of June's history that could be researched and I tried to verify it, including this sad story. Her husband was a security policeman at Wright, and she married him, they had a child. Well, his enlistment was up in 52, and he wanted her to leave. She didn't want to go because she had done some work that had come to the attention of the people who were working on starting the United States Space Program. And they wanted her to be a clerk stenographer and office manager. That's what she was good at. But she went with her husband instead because that's what women did in that age. They eventually ended up in Portland, had trouble in their marriage along the way. On their 10th wedding anniversary, her husband went out front to put license tabs on the car before they were gonna go out for the evening. And a drunk driver came around the corner and smashed into the rear of the vehicle with her husband in between. And his last act was to shove their son out of the way. That's the newspaper article that covers that. But see, that's how you investigate. You try to verify every detail that you can. This was June's obituary. The last time I talked to June, when she was on hospice in 98, I said, what do you want me to do, June? I've got all this material from you. And she said, simply tell my story, June. I've done it over and over again. If you're interested, that's my book. Please stop by and I'll be glad to provide one. I'm gonna to have to move this along or I'm, I know I'm gonna run out. I think I'm gonna skip through the Westport crash. Much as that's a good one. I talked to a bunch, I'll go quickly. I talked to other cops I worked with. I started with the Aberdeen, Washington Police Department in May of 1979. And in November of that year, I was still what you would call a rookie. And I didn't see much daylight and I didn't take the newspaper. If I had read the paper, I would have seen that for Monday, November 26, 1979, right after Thanksgiving weekend. Now that would have got my attention that was the first of five stories, Air Force interested in UFO. Search called off for UFO. They had to check to make sure that nobody was missing any airplanes or helicopters. Nobody was. But something came down out of the sky on fire that was seen over a distance of 40 miles by multiple witnesses. It made one maneuver to avoid striking the city of Westport or going into the Pacific Ocean, and instead it crashed across the mudflats by the Elk River Bridge. Hundreds of people called the Sheriff's Office and all of the law enforcement agencies, etc., to report this wild light coming down in the sky. The military was apparently en route. They sealed the logging roads the next day, wouldn't let anybody through, and then they took whatever it was away. Anybody sense a common theme here? A UFO crash and a military removal and a whole lot of secrecy. Because it all went conveniently away. One of the witnesses is Stella Kressel. My daughter drew a, rec a recreation of what Stella described. This odd craft that was bigger in the front than in the back and had big illuminated windows. And she kept saying, I just knew that they were telling me we're in trouble, we're going down. That's the map of the area. I wrote a short book about my report on that particular crash. The Mount Rainier case, June 24th, 1947, 
By no means the first UFO case, there were many at that time. Interestingly enough, Portland, Oregon had numerous UFO sightings at the same time. The witnesses were on-duty Portland police officers. That's what's wild. One officer says it looks like a wobbling hubcap. That's how a cop would describe a UFO. It's perfect. They describe this odd wobbling motion. I'm going to tell you about this case briefly because it's important. A cloaked UFO. This man was a millwright. He remembered a story when he was a young man going down the road with his friend. They had been fishing after they got off work. They're standing in a roadway on a perfectly beautiful sunny day and all at once everything goes dead silent. That's the location over it, right on the border between Washington and Oregon, 1983. Everything goes from birds singing, insects chirping, etc., to dead quiet. Everything goes flat. While they're walking, something moves down this roadway that they can just barely see because it blurs the air but they can't see it directly. It's like, he described it like standing in front of a giant television set and being too close to the screen. So whatever it was, you were seeing what was behind it, but not perfectly. He told me that what this thing was like is that if you were standing on a runway and a 747 rolled right by you, imagine that tire on the airline rolling by me right now. The only problem is the airliner is invisible and it goes right by him and he feels like they're going to get flattened by this thing and then it's gone and everything comes back to normal. Now here's my question for you why I included it. If that's a real report if that's all completely accurate and it's representative of UFOs, what is coming and going around us all the time? If somebody or something has technology like that, we don't really have a good way of knowing what's coming and going. This is another case from Castle Rock. In 2012, Joanne and I interviewed a gentleman who was a retired commercial helicopter pilot. He goes into town to buy deodorant, takes his small dog in the pickup truck, comes back, drives up a windy road out onto a flat area of about a mile before he gets to his house. And he discovers that was taken from the inside of his pickup truck, and I've sort of recreated what he saw. He suddenly sees three huge spheres in the sky above him. It's dark. And these spheres have a hard edge and they have swirling light inside. He told me that it was light that was different than any light that he's ever seen. Kind of purple, kind of orange, kind of I can't tell you what color it is. I've heard that before. He can't decide whether he should stay there, turn around, or floor it. He votes for floor it. He goes to his house, jumps out of his truck, screams for his family. They come out the front door just in time to see the three spheres up in the air by his house, and they vanish into the sky like that. One, two, three, accelerating <coughs> upwards until they are gone, moving faster and faster and faster. Why would anybody make up a story like that? More especially, why would a man who is very devoutly religious, very strict Christian faith, and he told me that this upset him so bad that for weeks after that, he couldn't pay any attention to the sermons that he attended when he attended church regularly. <coughs> I interviewed him seven years later, and this is what he said. 
We evidently aren't the smartest kids on the block. We are being watched or visited or studied by other technologically advanced people. That's well said. On July 13th, my phone rang and a man called me and we kind of tap danced with each other because he wasn't sure whether he could trust me or not. He turned out to be a federal agent. I won't tell you what agency, and I will not reveal his name, I promise that. I didn't tell Mufon his name, and I won't. He was on duty in Vancouver, Washington. They were there to uh, apprehend somebody. They were on surveillance. He looked up in the sky over the river <coughs> towards Portland on the other side of the water. There's, he sees something about the size of a dime that's saucer shaped, and he went through the whole mental checklist because he had no background in UFOs. No propellers, no jet engines, no wings, no sound. It had the peculiar wobbling motion that gets described over and over again. It gets two thirds of the way across the sky, and then the weird thing happens. And the weird thing is, it's like somebody drew a line in the air, and as the craft crosses the line, it shimmers and disappears. While he's standing there with his jaw hanging down, here comes an F-15 fighter jet, full bore, headed in the same direction, which would have been from the Portland airport, because they have a squadron, a active response squadron there ready ready to go at all times. Uh, this man is a bona fide federal agent. I've seen his badge, I've seen his credentials, I've read his curriculum vitae, I met him in person three times, I had numerous email communications with him. This is the kind of man that we hope all federal agents are. He's the poster child for an excellent federal agent. In the prime of his life, excellent health, excellent eyesight, Sane, sober, educated, trained, rational observer. He cannot figure out what he saw. Because this case had been called in three days after it happened, I paid the 200 bucks to get the radar data from the FAA. And then I had a friend of mine who's a retired NOAA weatherman unpack it and put it on a map. Those possible UFO returns up there were two locations where there was a solid object that had no transponder. All airplanes must operate with a transponder that says, here's my serial number, I'm a friendly. That's a legal requirement. These solid returns were in the air and they had no transponder. They also easily showed the trail of the F-15. So in short, what I have there, I have a witness who risked his career to make a report to me. He's a perfect witness. We eventually got radar evidence to confirm what he saw. His descriptions are flawless. I can't do any better than that unless I can bring you the UFO in on a trailer. That's an excellent move on. Pick that as one of the 10 best UFO cases of the year. Here are my conclusions, and this will be very brief. This is what that federal agent told me several years later, because I called him up and said, what do you think about what you saw? This is five years ago. And although I would have laughed at what I'm about to say five years ago, it may be the most important topic in human history. The gravity of what it all means has certainly sunk in over the years. And like all of my best, all of my best UFO witnesses have done this, People with no background in UFOs and when after we're done working out their report, 
they become like sponges. They want to know, are there other people like me? Uh, where can I get more books? Where can I get more information? How do I know more about this thing that changed my life because it doesn't fit in anywhere? Here's my conclusion. The echoes of our visitors resound throughout human history. I am convinced that if we knew the complete, uncensored story of humanity on Earth, nothing would be the same. And I'm hopeful because of that, because I think it would draw mankind together, not tear us apart like we are now. The question, what if we are being changed by UFO reality as individuals to prepare us for contact as a civilization? When people talk about disclosure, I say that it's already happening. This is disclosure. It's all disclosure. If you liked this video, be sure to check out our other content and get connected on our page and social media sites. Every day, new discoveries are being made all across the world and beyond. So let's work together to find out what's next. And remember, we won't know if we don't go. I'll see you in the Vortex.